Before we proceed to the video, for more LEAD AP O plus M study material, you can contact me on my email and on my LinkedIn as usual. Hello and welcome to Sustainable Sites. Uh, 10 points for this credit category maximum. And this is the distribution that we will be going through one by one. It has one prerequisite called site management policy and we have seven credits. Uh, I would like to mention two things here. One, the sustainable site is uh, generally dealing with everything on the outdoors of the project. So if you have uh, any light pollution reduction, for example, we have a credit here, it's dealing with the outdoor lights. Uh, mainly it deals with anything that is outdoor. In the indoors, we have different uh, credits and different uh, categories to deal with. This is first. Secondly, uh, one thing that will be consistent in all the other credit categories as well is that if you have any policy in the prerequisite, it is usually followed by uh, the credit implementing that policy. We've got other policies coming like green cl uh, cleaning policy, we have purchasing uh, policies, and they are followed by the respective credits. So this is what we'll be going through one by one. So let's move on to the first prerequisite. So the one and only prerequisite is site management policy uh, for sustainable sites. And uh, the intended requirement is to create and implement a policy that is going to manage and deploy the best practices to reduce the harmful chemical use. And also if there is any air pollution due to the operational elements, if there is any chemical runoff, if there is any energy and solid waste. As we said that we are basically dealing with the exterior of the project or of the building. So what, uh, what things can fall? in uh, under this management uh, policy uh, the emissions uh, the low emissions equipment can be used the equipment could be of uh, your lawnmower that is used ex in the exterior or if there is any leaf blower if it was uh, propane powered or if it was uh, gasoline powered you can go for low or zero emissions equipment you can use all the time manual uh, lawnmower instead of a powered one uh, the snow and ice removal is required by law around your project. Uh, you can implement certain strategies like you can pre-treat your pavement, uh, which will reduce tomorrow when, when the snow or ice has fallen, uh, the less amount of de-icer might be used. You can use salt-free de-icers. This is, this is, these are the policies that have to be implemented. And you can use electronic spreader controls to basically reduce the amount of de-icer that needs to be applied because it is now more evenly distributed by the electronic system. The building exterior cleaning can go with the power washing, which will reduce the amount of fluid, any, any chemical fluid that needs to be uh, mixed or, or uh, installed. And uh, you can reduce any gasoline equipment uh, or introduce any manual equipment instead of gasoline. Uh, organic waste management is important. Uh, the leaves that are going to fall, you can compost or mulch those leaves on site or any off-site facility that is uh, composting or mulching. Now, uh, we will see one by one in, uh, in the next slide uh, with the photos of, of all these uh, strategies like compost and mulching and power washing. So furthermore, things that fall under the site management policy is erosion and sedimentation control which is basically uh, taking out all the things from the drain that are not supposed to be there. It could be any debris or any garbage, and you should have a plan, not only for ongoing operations or maintenance operations, but if there are any new works that are to be planned and to be done on the project. If you're using any fertilizers for your uh, uh, outdoors, it should not be uh, based on ammonia. Uh, it should be quick release or organic or synthetic uh, fertilizers. Uh, invasive and uh, exotic plants management should be done. You have to identify if there is any uh, invasive or exotic vegetation and we have to eradicate them. We're going to see in the next slide what does it mean. And uh, the irrigation, if your uh, project uh, requires irrigation, you should uh, be looking for uh, any leaks or breaks and it has to be monitored every two weeks. The group plantings is going to reduce uh, your water usage. The drip irrigation is going to give you more efficiency in using uh, the outdoor water. Uh, for the storage of materials and equipment, uh, you have to do it better in a way which is recommended by the manufacturer and avoid any leakage to prevent any issues with the indoor air.
quality. So these are the things that fall under the site management policy. And uh, you just need to submit for documentation the policy document. And if you, uh, out of these uh, things, if you have not included any operational elements, you have to justify. For example, if you did not include any irrigation management, you can justify saying that you do not, you do not have any irrigation uh, on your project. So uh, this is what uh, the requirement of the documentation is. Power washing is something that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, the, it's kind of self-explanatory what it is doing, uh, using the pressurized water to serve uh, the cleaning purpose, and it's doing nicely. The only thing is that they are trying to avoid any use of any fluid or any chemical which might be harmful to the environment. Uh, we have uh, also seen invasive and exotic plants uh, that are to be eradicated. First of all, they are to be identified, then they have to be eradicated. The best is to use the native plants. Now, the, there is a small difference between invasive and exotic plants. The exotic plants is not native to the area but exotic plant may or may not be harmful for the ecosystem but invasive plant is not only non-native but it is also harmful for the ecosystem so for this management site management policy we have to identify and eradicate drip irrigation uh, i'm sure many of you have seen just use the smart uh, uh, irrigation system for the uh, better use of water in irrigation compost or mulch uh, Basically, both are decayed uh, organic materials, usually leaves and other plant material. But uh, there's a small difference. The compost act as a fertilizer. It is usually mixed with uh, the fertilizers, whereas mulch uh, you spray or you spread on top of the soil. And it is uh, basically used to retain the moisture in the soil. And uh, it also try to keep the weeds away. So uh, this is what a uh, slide of difference in between. Uh, compost and mulch but both are decayed materials so credit number one site management for one point uh, if you see in the reference guide the site management is the last credit but i have put it together with the site management policy because i thought it makes more sense the intent is to preserve ecological integrity environmentally sensitive site management practices and the purpose is to provide clean and maintain exterior of the building, uh, which is basically sort of the requirement or the intent of the policy as well. That's the reason the requirement for this credit number one is to implement the prerequisite and one of the options. So the first option is uh, the limited turf area for one point. Uh, you have to limit the turf for less than or uh, equal to 25% of the total vegetated areas and playgrounds or fields in schools or parks should be excluded in that calculation. Uh, straightforward credit, the percentage of total vegetated area would be turf uh, divided by the total area, including turf by 100. So uh, documentation, just you need to show that uh, the turf area is complying with the above formula. And you can go for either this option or the second option. So out of the three options, the option number two is to use all manual and electric powered equipment uh, which are used to serve the purpose of operation and maintenance in the building exterior. So it should not include only the uh, equipment used by uh, the project team, but also if there is any vendor who is providing these services, the equipment from this vendor should also be considered and the replacement might be necessary. So the documentation is just the complete inventory showing that it is either manual or electric powered. These are some of the examples that you can see. Lawnmower uh, going from uh, the gas powered or propane powered to manual. Also the leaf blower going all electric. The option number three is to show and maintain the reductions from the emissions uh, from the site maintenance equipment. Now in the previous one we saw that uh, equipment uh, replacement was necessary because you have to go all electric so in this one they are giving you an option to reduce the number of uh, or reduce the emissions that are being uh, emitted in the atmosphere by these maintenance equipment so 50 percent reduction in uh, hydrocarbons uh, and NOx 75 percent in carbon monoxide from the baseline now from where the baseline will come the current practices are to be entered in a USDBC calculator 
with, uh, for example, the model of the equipment, the type of the equipment, how many equipments of such type you are using, and for how long you are using that equipment will give you a baseline. And then we have the strategy from option number two that if we replace the gas powered by electrical or manual, definitely it is going to reduce the number of emissions from the baseline. And also the second is that we can reduce the running time of the equipment and it will also reduce uh, the emissions from the baseline that is being calculated. So sometimes it's not possible to, uh, to transfer all of them to the electric, but the third option is given in order to reduce the, uh, the emissions from the baseline. So calculation of baseline emissions by the USGBC calculator and the reduction re results comparison sheets how you reduce the number of emissions it could be either by replacing the equipment certain of a certain uh, number of equipments or by reducing the runtime so credit number two is site development protect a resource habitat for two number of points maximum one to two points uh, we've got multiple options the requirement is to conserve uh, any existing natural areas on site and to restore if there are any damaged areas and the purpose is to promote biodiversity biodiversity in the simplest word is uh, in the simplest form is the variability of life and it's uh, natural to have uh, the species thriving in its own natural environment so option number one is on-site restoration uh, to have in place native or adaptive vegetation for 20 percent of total site area so if you have uh, any site area that you know uh, for the, your project multiplied by 0.2 or 20 percent and this would be the required area for native or adaptive vegetation. But there is uh, a, a constraint that minimum of 5,000 square feet is to be there to achieve this credit. In, in case it's not there, then you have to go to the other options. And uh, as we said that uh, the species thrive in the natural environment. So if any environment that was naturally unvegetated, like it could be a rocky mountain or uh, if there is any pond or you are in a desert in that case it will count itself you would not need to vegetate that area because that is naturally an unvegetated area so the documentation is the total site area of your project the vegetated area based on the calculation that we have uh, seen uh, multiplying by 20 percent and if there are any natural and vegetated areas the documentation proof is to be submitted and this is option number one if uh, your project does not comply with the 5,000 square feet, then you have to uh, find your solution or to earn this credit in other options. So the other options will be discussed. So the second option is straightforward, but it might cost you a little bit because you have to provide financial support of five cents per square feet of the total site area. The previous, in the previous option, the total site area uh, is to be multiplied by 20% in order to have native and adaptive vegetation protecting or restoring uh, uh, the habitat but in this case you just need to provide five cents per total square feet of uh, the project and uh, this would be the minimum financial contribution if you are in us uh, it should uh, the land trust should be recognized by land trust alliance and in case you are outside us it should be locally recognized and within 100 miles of the project the documentation is to provide the financial support calculations which requires the uh, total uh, site area times 0 0.05 and the agreement with the land trust and if they are acc accredited in case of us by lta and local for others the exemplary performance can be earned in this uh, credit uh, in this credit with option number one and option number two option number one you can show 40 percent native vegetation and for option number two if you increase from five cents to ten cents per square feet so credit number three is rainwater management for three points uh, but for school adaptation only two points uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, credit which uh, the intent is to reduce the runoff uh, and improve water quality by replicating the natural hydrology of that uh, area or of that environment based on what we have received the historical conditions now if you see the figure below on the left and on the right uh, the one on the left is showing the natural uh, hydrology and the right one is showing after the infrastructure was built so what is the difference the runoff is 10 percent in the natural condition whereas it is 55 percent in the built environment or with the infrastructure 
uh, and the, in 55% runoff, it is directed towards the storm drains. And uh, the infiltration, shallow infiltration is 25%, which means that the area was pervious. It allows the water to go inside, whereas in case of impervious areas, the shallow infiltration is only 10% and deep infiltration is only 5%. And impervious means that in, in uh, the right figure, uh, there was asphalt or there was concrete or there were blocks or tiles that did not allow the water to be charged inside. So we have to find a way in order to charge the water in the ground and to slow off the runoff. Uh, the evapotranspiration of uh, the built environment is also 30 uh, compared to 40%. So we have some techniques that we can uh, deploy in order to replicate a natural hydrology. Uh, these are called uh, LID techniques or low impact development or green infrastructure GI practices to capture and treat water. Uh, now there is a certain small calculation 20, from 25% of impervious surfaces. We know what is impervious surface and 95th percentile storm event. So if you have a rainfall data, uh, you, can, you can know that what is the 95th percentile uh, of, the, of the historical rain uh, flow, uh, rain data in that area and how much water uh, that you need to treat. And you have to establish annual inspections that these uh, numbers are being followed. So you should have a rainfall data for the documentation showing the 95th percentile value of the water that you need to manage on ground and uh, the runoff volume of 25% of impervious area and the calculation of water managed by uh, green infrastructure and low impact development techniques. Uh, you have to show that you have uh, uh, maintained the inspections and uh, the maintenance is done for all the works. So now let's see what uh, are the G GI and LID techniques. I explained this uh, in detail uh, in also lead AP BD plus C videos in rainwater management uh, credit. And I will post the link to that video and I will also show to which minute you can uh, forward it to in order to understand it better. So uh, the green infrastructure and LID techniques, uh, the main purpose is to do th two things. One is to slow down the speed of water and the second one is to find a way to charge the water back in the ground, which is uh, basically replicating the natural hydrology. So this is all these tech, uh, this is what all these techniques do. Bias whales and rain gardens, they capture the water, they retain the water and they uh, charge the ground back in. The rainwater harvesting is another technique that is uh, collecting the water and you can uh, use this water again for any irrigation purposes. If you have a proper plumbing system, you can uh, charge them back into the toilets. Uh, green roofs serve two purposes. If you have proper uh, piping, it can uh, also slow down the water on, on the roof level and then the remaining water can be captured as rainwater harvesting. The permeable pavers not only slows down the speed of the water because it's unlike the asphalt and uh, other paving, uh, it has gaps in between so the water slows down and also it charges back into the ground. And we have an exemplary performance of one point if uh, water is captured and treated from 50% uh, instead of 25% impervious surfaces. The next credit is heat island reduction. But let us quickly review the heat island effect first, which is when there is a temperature difference of th uh, 3 degrees uh, in between the urban and suburban setting, basically due to the human activities. So what are those human activities? If you see on uh, the figure in the right, uh, there is heat from the road surface uh, and there is heat released uh, from the vehicles that are running on, on these uh, roads, which are not uh, as many as in the suburban setting. Then heat is being extracted from the buildings and released into, into the atmosphere from the heat pumps, then the heat reflected from the building surfaces. So there are a lot of things that, uh, are not there in the suburb, uh, suburban areas or in the suburbs, and it is there in the urban areas due to human activities, there is this three degrees difference. So we have to find a way or find strategies in order to reduce this heat island effect. So uh, there are some other terminologies that are going to be used and I will be discussing it in the next slide, and then we will move on to the heat island reduction credit.
Some other terminologies that we need to understand before we move on to the options is solar reflectance and solar reflectance index. The difference is that the solar reflectance is used for non-roof materials, which means that the things that are not used basically as a roof. They are used to shade, uh, but they are not basically used as a roof. And it's also known as albedo. Just to measure the solar heat reje rejection, how much it rejects based on, uh, on a scale of 0 to 1. 0 means absorption, 1 indicates total reflection. But when it comes to the roofing materials, we use solar reflecti uh, reflectance index, which is not only that how much heat it reflects, but also how quickly a surface releases or emits absorbed heat and returns to its normal temperature because inhabitants or uh, the occupants is inside so uh, if it does not emit or uh, the, the if it does not emit the absorbed heat it will be translated down and change the atmosphere inside the building so for the roofing materials these two factors are used known as reflective index reflectance index and the standard black is zero and standard white is 100 if you try to uh, try to generalize both of them the more the better if you are closer to one or you are closer to 100 you are uh, uh, using the, the best of it and three year age sr and sris will be used in in the options it, uh, it should be used as per the american society of testing material standard uh, and the clause e1980 so now we are going to see the option now we know what is sr what is heat island effect and what is sri used for non-roof and roof respectively credit number four heat island reduction for one to two points now we have gone through what is uh, sr or albedo what is sri what does heat island effect means so the intended requirement for this credit is to minimize effect on human and wildlife habitats by reducing the heat island effect. We know there are two things, non-roof and roof, SR and SRI. So first we'll look at, uh, out of four options, let's look at the first one, which is the combination of the following strategies for minimum 50% of site paving. Now site paving is outdoors, uh, of course, excluding the vegetated areas, it could be like uh, the parking area and the, the walking path and you can have plant shading or vegetated planters but these should be installed during the uh, the plants should be there physically in the performance period shading with the photovoltaic system is also one of the strategy architectural shading we're going to see what it is in the next slide uh, as as an example or paving material with three year aged uh, sr or solar reflectance or albedo of 0.28 or initial uh, albedo of 0.33 now there is a possibility that uh, your architectural shading or paving material uh, has different components or uh, you have different uh, sr for paving material and different for architectural shading and it might be less than 0.28 uh, three year aged or less than 0.33 initially in that case uh, still compliance is possible by making the weighted average uh, if you see the formula below area of high reflectance non-roof uh, a times the solar high reflectance uh, non-roof a by required sr so it's going to give you the ratio divided by 0.5 which is the requirement of 50 percent uh, side paving plus the other one that is compliant of uh, this sr values and it's uh, adding them all up should be greater than total side paving area so uh, it's not like you have to have all of the materials or non-roof uh, uh, shading or paving uh, complying with 0.28 or 0.33 it is possible uh, to use the weighted average and the last one is open grade paving system with 50 percent unbound what is unbound uh, simply to put it in in a straightforward uh, way is that if you're not using concrete if you're not using asphalt this would be the unbound paving the example would be the compacted sand and on top if you have the interlock now the documentation for this option number one is to have total non-roof area calculations because based on these calculations you should have 50% of uh, site paving, site plan with the project boundary, building footprint with non-roof area measure, uh, measurements. Uh, this is required because uh, you have to compare it with uh, the non-roof measured area of uh, uh, the reflected the paving material or architectural shading or the other uh, strategies that you have put together 
and manufacturer's document for SR values and maintenance plan. Uh, SR values would be uh, would be given by the material that you would be purchasing. So let's look at option number two. So you have one of these options and other three options. Quick photo references of open grade paving. This, if you remember, is also helpful in rainwater management. Then you have got PV shading. It uh, cre uh, creates electricity for you and also provide uh, as uh, the P <coughs> has the shading for uh, your vehicles. And architectural shading is something you look in, in the below left corner of the screen. This is not only a design, but it's also providing uh, the shading or fulfilling the shading purposes. And you've got cool pavements, which reflects uh, more than the standard one. And the dark pavement reflects only 10%, whereas your cooler pavement is going to reflect around 40%. So these uh, are some of the strategies that serve the purpose of reducing the heat island effect. So option number two is roofing measures or roof measures for one point. And we have multiple strategies from which we can combine different strategies to achieve the required area. 50% of total vegetative roof is going to work. Uh, roofing material for 75%. If you are using vegetated roof, then it will uh, comply with 50% and roofing material should cover 75% of total roof. And uh, we have two types of roof, low sloped and high sloped roof. The low sloped roof is usually more uh, exposed to the sun for uh, more number of hours. High sloped roof will be exposed to less number of hours. That's the reason that low sloped roof have higher initial and three year uh, aged uh, SRI or solar reflectance index value of 82 and 64 respectively. And for high sloped, you have SRI 39 and three year aged 32. Turf, by the way, does not count as a roofing measure. So uh, the following is the formula. After documentation, you can see the area of high reflectance roof by 0.75 as it, uh, it needs 75%. For vegetated roof is 0.5 uh, which is 50 percent and the combination of these two strategies should be more than the total roof area and for the documentation you should submit total roof area calculations and site plan with the project boundary building footprint with the roof area measures and the manufacturer's documentation which shows what are the sri values because you will be submitting them for the review uh, this is option number two let's look at option number three it is the combination of the two non-roof plus roof measures for two points. It's simply adding them all up and it should be equal to total site paving area plus total roof area. And the documentation is also the addition of these two documentation. Uh, let's have a look at uh, some of the roof measures uh, in, in a photographic form. So this is a high sloped roof and you can see the low sloped roof and uh, it's more exposed to the sun that's why the higher initial sri and three age values the reflective material is going to reflect the sun more and it's also going to have a less uh, heat transfer below the roof and vegetated roof is not only good looking but it also serves the purpose of rain management and here also in uh, the heat island reduction option number four is parking under cover for one point Minimum 50% of parking should be under cover. Now, there is a possibility that you have a parking in an open air or you have a parking building. If it works as a building, in that case, the uh, last floor or the roof of that building should have a roofing measures. And if uh, it is on the ground and uh, you have a shading system, then it should follow the non-roof measures. So uh, if it is a roofing structure, or a roofing measure than three year age SRI uh, of 32 or initial 39, or a structure can also be uh, considered for renewable energy system like photovoltaic cell covered that we have uh, seen in the previous slide. Motorcycle parking equals car parking. So when you are calculating the 50% of parking, motorcycle will be considered as one parking space. And underground uh, parking qualifies for uh, parking undercover. Roof may or may not be included under the conditions that I have uh, explained. So for the documentation, the parking space calculations and the documentation of SR and SRI based on roof and non-roofing measures based on uh, the system of the parking. And it should include the maintenance program to ensure consistent compliance with the credit. Now the exemplary performance of one point can be earned if you maximize uh, the requirements of uh, option number one, two, three, and four 
to 95% in option number four is 50% if you uh, are moving all the parking or 95% of the parking under cover then you are entitled to have exemplary performance of one point credit number five is light pollution reduction for one point and this is the light in the outdoors since sustainable site talks about outdoors mainly uh, the purpose is to reduce the impact of artificial light and improve the visibility in the night uh, we've got more than one option the first one is fixture shielding for one point uh, there are two things that are need to be considered first is uh, the lamp, mean lamp lumens which we can uh, find out on the data sheet of the fixture a sample data sheet is here on the left in the blue and uh, this is one requirement second is if uh, they do not emit light at angle more than 90 degrees from down if they do not emit, the fixture is just compliant. If they emit, then we have to find a way to stop. Uh, there are multiple strategies. One is retrofitting. Either you find a way to make uh, a cover or a shield uh, to put it on that fixture. Or the second is if you change the lamp, that is less than 2,500 mean lumens. So you will not fall in that category and you do not need to sh shield that fixture. Uh, a sample fixture would be like this one. These kind of fixtures basically do not emit because the shielding is there. They do not emit light more than 90 degrees from down. And uh, why it needs to be shielded? Because if uh, more than 2,500 lumens and you do not shield them, this is what you uh, can see from uh, above from space, which looks nice from space. But if you look up from uh, the ground to the space, uh, the, the picture on the right shows that in the inner city, it's really hard to uh, see any stars, which is basically the nighttime visibility. So the more you go outside uh, the urban areas, the more uh, stars you are going to see. So it's not like the stars were not there when you were in the urban setting. This is because of the light pollution that you are not able to see them. So the documentation for uh, fixture shielding is just the luminar shielding information. If you have done any retrofits, send the photographs and the data sheets that needs to confirm that uh, the lamp lumens are more or less than 2,500. The second option is uh, perimeter measurements for one point. You have to have uh, equidistant spacing. Minimum eight measurements are to be taken and the maximum spacing in between could be 100 feet. At that level, you have to measure light illuminance levels uh, and this can be done by uh, any light meter and the level difference between the lighting on and off should not be more than 20%. So one reading has to be taken with the light on, the other has to be taken with the light off and the difference in between the two should not be more than 20%. Uh, each measure, measurement should comply. It's not like the average, you can take the average measurements and it's less than or more than uh, 20%. Every single measurement should not exceed 20%. And the measurements uh, can be taken after dawn or before dusk uh, because you need two of them. So the documentation is side boundary showing all lighting points and the distance between the measurement points. Illumination measures for each point and percentage difference is need to be uh, recorded. Uh, this is the site lighting and you can see that you have to space them almost uh, minimum 100 feet apart and minimum eight number of um, measurements are to be taken. So this is uh, an alternative to fixer shielding for one point. Credit number six is site improvement plan for one point which is to preserve ecological integrity and encourage environmental. It's kind of uh, similar to protecting restoring habitat but in a way that you have a plan for another upcoming five years so you should have a documentation of your existing site conditions what's your uh, what's the situation of your hydrology vegetation how you can improve it and uh, what's your uh, improvement strategy uh, what would be the monitoring protocols and uh, this plan should address uh, if there are any water bodies or how you're going to manage the rainwater if uh, there is any reuse opportunities for uh, the used water, gray water or rainwater, and how would you uh, reduce the potable water use uh, if you are uh, gathering any uh, HVAC condensate. So th this is uh, where it is uh, addressing the hydrology part. Then you should have 
uh, something in your plan that addresses the vegetation, what's existing, uh, how you are planning for the native and invasive plants, if you are eradicating them or identifying them, and uh, how it's going to protect uh, the native species, uh, basically the biodiversity, and the soils uh, should also be addressed about the soil structure, how you are going to preserve, that is uh, healthy soil, and a remediation of any compacted soil. So this is basically a high level plan, uh, five years uh, minimum, and uh, you have to improve the conditions of these three factors. And the documentation is uh, to submit this plan. And uh, if you are, have uh, taken any low or no cost measures to improve these uh, uh, strategies or hydrology, vegetation and soil uh, topics, and qualification of professional consultants if you have uh, hired them to make this plan. Credit number six is joint use of facilities, 1.4 school only. If you remember that the rainwater management, the school had one point less. So this is where the school is, uh, or the adaptation of school is recuperating that one point to make the total of sustainable site 10 points. And the requirement is to integrate a school with the community by sharing the building and its facilities like the playing fields for any other events that are not related to the school and some function that can be held in the space. The purpose is that the school is used or school is uh, utilized in the school hours and after two or three o'clock the facility is vacant and it can be used for other purposes. So we've got multiple options. Uh, every, every option is going to give one point. At least uh, the first is to have at least three of the following uh, available for public use. So you are integrating the public with, with the school facility. Uh, usually they have gym, auditorium, cafe, uh, a playing field, joint parking, uh, or more than uh, one classroom. Uh, the stadium can be used. Uh, so these facilities which are dead or not used after three o'clock can be utilized by the public and uh, it can also give the school a one point. Uh, but one thing needs to make sure that the access of washroom after school hours are available to everyone who is going to the auditorium, gym, cafe, or whatever three facilities you are choosing to share with the public. Uh, for option number two, you should have a contract with the community to provide at least two of the following. You can have inside school two of the following, uh, of course, after the school hours. You can have a health clinic, commercial office, community service center, police office, library, media center, parking, one or more commercial business. So uh, the first one was the pub, uh, for the public. The second option is for the community. And the third option is, it, uh, in, this is different from uh, the first two in the sense that uh, they are not using school facility, but school is using other facilities. Share at least two of the following spaces owned by other organization to students. So in this case, students are using the other facilities like auditorium, if there is anyone nearby, gym, cafe, playing field, swimming pool, or any stadium nearby. But we have to make sure that uh, the access to all these facilities in option number three is uh, by foot and uh, in, in the walking uh, distance and safe uh, walk, walking is uh, possible from the school to these facilities. So documentation is the uh, signed agreement, how spaces will be shared, after what time, the uh, uh, access to the washroom in case of option one is available and site plan showing pedestrian access. This is what uh, I said in option number three, that pedestrian access, a safe pedestrian access from school to all of the uh, option number three uh, should be provided uh, and distance from school to joint use spaces. So this sums up the sustainable sites uh, chapter or credit category. I will continue on with the water efficiency. Thank you very much for your attention. Credit number six is joint use of facilities, 1.4 school only. If you remember that the rainwater management, the school had one point less. So this is where the school is, uh, or the adaptation of school is recuperating that one point to make the total of sustainable site 10 points. And the requirement is to integrate a school with the community by sharing the building and its facilities like the playing fields for any other events that are not related to the school and some function that can be held in the space. The purpose is that the school is used or school is uh, utilized 
in the school hours and after two or three o'clock the facility is vacant and it can be used for other purposes so we've got multiple options uh, every every option is going to give one point at least uh, the first is to have at least three of the following uh, available for public use so you are integrating the public with with the school facility uh, usually they have gym auditorium cafe uh, a playing field joint parking uh, or more than uh, one classroom uh, the stadium can be used uh, so these facilities which are dead or not used after three o'clock can be utilized by the public and uh, it can also give the school a one point uh, but one thing needs to make sure that the access of washroom after school hours are available to everyone who is going to the auditorium gym cafe or whatever three facilities you are choosing to share with the public uh, for option number two you should have a contract with the community to provide at least two of the following you can have inside school two of the following uh, of course after the school hours you can have a health clinic commercial office community service center police office library media center parking one or more commercial business so uh, the first one was the pub, uh, for the public the second option is for the community and the third option is it, uh, in, this is different from uh, the first two in the sense that uh, they are not using school facility, but school is using other facilities. Share at least two of the following spaces owned by other organization to students. So in this case, students are using the other facilities like auditorium, if there is anyone nearby, gym, cafe, playing field, swimming pool, or any stadium nearby. But we have to make sure that uh, the access to all these facilities in option number three is uh, by foot and uh, in the, in the walking uh, distance and safe uh, walk, walking is uh, possible from the school to these facilities so documentation is the uh, signed agreement how spaces will be shared after what time the uh, uh, access to the washroom in case of option one is available and site plan showing pedestrian access this is what uh, i said in option number three that pedestrian access a safe pedestrian access from school to all of the uh, option number three uh, should be provided uh, and distance from school to joint use spaces. So this sums up the sustainable sites uh, chapter or credit category. I will continue on with the water efficiency. Thank you very much for your attention.